Now I'll tell you one more thing before we get started, and this actually does have a little something to do with my message. The other songs I was saying this morning had to do with the blood. When I first got saved, and I know I've shared this story with many people before, I went into a church. Uh, like, you know, I had that long hair. I was doing, you know, all this stuff I wasn't supposed to be doing. And my sister said, we're going to church. My mama had to kick me out of her house um, because of the life that I was living. I'd been arrested for multiple things, uh, you know, bound up with drugs and alcohol. All I ever wanted to do was sleep with the next girl. Did, you know, just that was just my life was a mess. I mean, that's all I knew. And mama said, you can't live here anymore, dude. You're causing trouble. You're affecting me. You're affecting your sister. You got to go. And there was nowhere really for me to go. But thank God my oldest sister, Debbie, had already been a born-again Christian. And she said, you know what? I'll take a chance on you. You can come live over here. Well, when I showed up at her door, she said, we're going to church tonight. Do you want to come? And I said, you know what? It's time for me to go to church. You know? And so I went with her to church that night. And there was that woman preacher. And boy, I tell you, she was a powerful woman, man. I mean, look, dude. <laughs> I heard that little Angie got a little bit of fire up in her belly. She was the one that preached for me last Sunday. But anyway, Sister Tut, dude, she was just, she was a big one, too. And she was just, and she was strong, man. I've been telling you right now. You probably didn't want to get in a wrestling match with her. But she, when she preached, she, she preached with fire and with authority, you know. And I can remember her preaching. She kept talking about the blood. So, you know, in that song, it keeps talking about the blood. And I can remember, like, thinking, why are you talking about the blood? It just made me so uncomfortable. Like, why do they keep talking about the blood? And all of a sudden, she explained it. She said that the innocent one had to die in place of the guilty one. He was the innocent one. I was the guilty one. I didn't realize it, but the Bible talks about the blood throughout it because it's talking about the shedding of blood and the giving of life and the death of the sacrifice to pay the penalty of sin. I didn't know what all that meant, and it just made me so uncomfortable when she kept talking about the blood. And then all of a sudden, she said she stopped everything. Boy, I tell you, Lord... Speak to me like that. Huh? She stopped everything. She said, somebody in here, you need to get saved. And she said, you need right now the Lord speaking to you. And we're not moving forward till you give your heart to, to, to the Lord. And dude, all I can tell you is you do what you want. But my heart started beating out of my chest. Dude, I was so uncomfortable. And it was like, God's speaking. He, she said, you, God's speaking to you. That's why you feel the way you do. Dude, I jumped up. I ran out of that altar. I didn't care what anybody thought. I fell on my knees. I raised my hands in the air. I said, Lord, change me. And guess what? The next day, I still didn't understand really what the blood meant that much. But as time has gone on, I've learned the gospel. I've learned things having to do with the word of God. And I've realized how so far away my understanding was before of the things of God compared to as I continued to live for God. All right. And so this morning we're going to be reading out of Colossians. Uh, Colossians chapter chapter one. Actually, why don't we do that? Why don't we go to Colossians chapter one and we're just going to go ahead and uh, read. Read some of that passage of scripture. Um, I think we're going to read all the way through. Uh, we'll just we'll just read chapter one, and then there, I think we're going to use some some text out of chapter two. But I don't want to read both whole both of the chapters. <laughs> chapter one, starting in verse one, it says, "Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ." which are at Colossae. That was a city that Paul was writing this letter to, okay? Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world and brings forth fruit as it does also in you since the day you heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. So real quick, I mean, I didn't plan on stopping, but what he's saying is, is that he's writing a letter to us to a church in a city and he's saying, look, the gospel's going forward and it's going forward and it's bearing fruit in people's lives. When the gospel seed is spoken and planted in a heart, Fruit begins to manifest itself because it's causing change. And it's doing this all over the world. We've got to remember that 
the church started off with Jesus and his disciples. And then on the day of Pentecost, as the Holy Spirit hit them, they received the power of the Holy Ghost to go forward and to tell others about the good news of the gospel. Amen. The only reason I want to bring that up real quick is to say, make a comment. How often, you know, I talk to people a lot about the Lord. And, there, and, you know, and even my daddy thought that whenever I first got saved or my sister was on fire for the Lord. Well, I think you can just get a little too rowdy with some of this religious stuff, too. You know, like, in other words, you talk too much about the Lord. I've had conversations with people on the phone. Dude, you talk too much about the Lord. That's why it's causing you trouble in this area and that area. Well, this is the thing. If the uh, disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ would have felt the way that you're trying to tell me I'm supposed to feel, then we wouldn't even be having this conversation today because nobody would be talking about Jesus. No seeds would have been planted. Nobody's life would have been changed. And the reality, all I'm trying to say is this, is that true disciples of the Lord Talk about Jesus. Amen. 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 Whenever God's changed your life and the fruit of the Lord has been manifested in your life, he becomes the topic of your conversation. Amen. Amen. It's just a natural tendency of the way things go. All right. He says in verse 7, as you also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the spirit. So Epaphras was their pastor. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. That doesn't mean that he, that he was created. Um, it, I just want to make that point. It's talking about that he was the first. The idea is, is that he was the first from which, and it goes on to explain it, creation came from him. For by him were all things created that are in heaven. You know that before Jesus was, was man, a man in the flesh, he was the eternal word of God. And that the way that creation took place was that the word spoke. The father had a plan. The word spoke. And the Holy Spirit hovered over the face of the deep. Amen. So the word spoke creation and the Holy Spirit enacted creation. In a similar way, the father has a plan of salvation. The word became flesh and fulfilled salvation. Now when the word about the word that was manifest in the flesh is spoken, the Holy Spirit hovers over the heart of man and creative miracle takes place in the heart of man. Amen. All right. It says, uh, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. He holds it all together. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled. You know what that means? You, you, were, you used to be alienated. In other words, you were separated from the things of God because of your wicked works. You were born of Adam, born in sin. You were living in the world. You were, you were alienated and separated from the life and the kingdom of God. But now he has reconciled you. In other words, you who were far away have now been brought back together with God. Amen. How did he do it? In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled. I'm going to read that again, just in case we all get that right there. Yeah. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard, and which was preached to every creature, which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. 
who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body. Say, you know how, you know how often, have you ever heard yourself whenever you're complaining about things, like especially stuff having to do with the church? Oh, Lord, I got to go back to practice. I know Randy doesn't feel that way. He likes playing the drums. But I'm just saying, you know, just for one example. Oh, I got to go to practice. Oh, I got to go teach the kids. Oh, I got to go clean the church. Oh, I got to prepare my sermon and <laughs> preach to them people again. Look at what Paul says. He says, I rejoice in my sufferings for you. You know where he is when he's writing this letter? He's in a Roman prison. He's in a Roman prison for preaching the gospel. He's saying, I rejoice in my sufferings for you. Because he understands that he's suffering for the kingdom of God. Because to Paul, this thing is real. He's seen the change that has taken place in his life. He's seen the fruit that has been manifested in his life. He sees the big picture. It's not about this temporary world that's always weighing us down, but that there's a kingdom of God to be inherited. Amen. And that and to be embraced. And so he is grateful for the opportunity to live his life, to give his life for the Lord. Right. He says, uh, which is the church. This is verse 25. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which has been hidden from the ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Now, can you think about that for a second? A mystery. Something that you can't really see. you got to uncover it, right? It's almost like a little bit of a mind puzzle. Sometimes, sometimes it's right there the whole time, but you just can't see it. That's the mystery of the gospel. For the ages, like even the Jewish people didn't understand what the gospel was really saying. It was a mystery to the Jewish people, the fulfillment of it, that it would become Jesus and what he would do at the cross. Many of us in our own lives, the gospel was a mystery for so long. Jesus was a mystery. We couldn't see it, right? We were going through life, going through the struggle of life, living our lives the same way each and every day, doing the party, doing whatever it was that we were doing, right? Till somebody told us about the mystery of Jesus. And when they told us about the mystery of Jesus and the Holy Spirit began to deal with our heart, there was a glimmer of hope, amen, that, yes. that was turned on and began to grow. And so I just want you to know that sometimes people just can't see the gospel. That doesn't mean that we give up. That doesn't mean that we quit. We have to keep encouraging them if they want to hear the gospel, if they want to believe the mystery. And there's some people that they don't believe the mystery and they don't want to believe the gospel. Well, I would recommend that you pray for them and that maybe you find someone else to pour the gospel into. Amen. But there's a mystery out there about Jesus that's waiting to be unveiled. Amen. But not everybody is really ready for it. To whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. That's talking about people like you and me. So in the Old Testament, the only people that knew God, they, even though they didn't understand Jesus completely, were the Israelite people. Right? But God's plan was that he would open up to the whole world. That he would open up to the whole world and all the people of the world to be able to know the mystery of Jesus so that they can become the people of God. Amen? To give them the opportunity to become the people of God. All right? He said, Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Amen? So I titled this morning's message, The Inheritance. And that's what I want to talk to you about. So once again, the Apostle Paul, he wrote this book, this letter. We call it a book. It was really a letter, an epistle is what it's called. He wrote it about AD 62 while he was in a Roman prison. He was in prison for preaching the gospel. And the letter would be sent by others that were attending to his needs to the city of Colossae, to the pastor Epaphras over there for the church to be read to the church. The purpose of the letter, the overall purpose of the letter was to combat false teaching. False teachers would come into the churches and begin to spread false doctrine that would cause confusion in the minds and hearts of the people. And ultimately with the, the purpose there of the enemy. You got to understand that fa every false doctrine and every false teaching is, is caused by the enemy of our soul. And his desire is to move us away from the truth so that ultimately our faith would be destroyed. We may talk a little bit about some of that as we move forward. But I got to tell you that every false doctrine 
It is caused from a demon spirit. Demon spirits, fallen angels working in conjunction with Satan, desiring to influence the hearts and minds of men that stand behind pulpits to preach false doctrine so that it spreads like an infection into the people that are listening to it and it moves them away from the truth of the gospel and moves them further away from the things of God. A lot of false doctrine will try to make you feel comfortable in your sin. A lot of false doctrine will try to make you feel like you're okay where you are. You don't need to move. You don't need to change nothing. It's all good. No, no. The word of God is clear. There's some things that are right. There's some things that are wrong. And he wants to give you the strength in order to be able to do what is right. Amen. Essentially, I want you to know that an inheritance is a right of ownership that is given by another to someone else. In other words, you didn't, you weren't able to receive the inheritance in and of your own. Somebody had to give it to you, right? When my daddy died, he left me a little something. Whenever, uh, if somebody has something to leave, some people don't, right? But but when God, what we're talking about this morning is the inheritance of God. God has let, has an inheritance for His children. Amen. Proverbs 13, 22 says a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. An inheritance is something that is given from one person to another. In the case of what we're discussing this morning, we're talking about the fact that God has an inheritance for the people who will choose to serve him. The opposite of that will be those who choose instead to get their own from what the world has to offer. Let me just slow down and say that again. God has an inheritance for the people who choose to serve him. Amen. The other people are going to be those who chose instead of going God's way to receive what the world was offering them today. Sometimes that can be real confusing. In other words, what I want to try to encourage you or challenge you to think about this morning is what does it really look like to be a child of God? What does that mean to you? What does it mean to you to be a child of God? Amen? Does it mean that one time in vacation Bible school I prayed a prayer? Does it mean that one time when I was in the church I raised my hand and I said, yes, I want Jesus? Or that I was in a car one time and I said, yes, I believe in Jesus? Is that what it means? Or is there more to it to really being a child of God? What does it look like to be a child of God? All right? Um, ultimately... That was one of the things that I put here as an example, what the world has to offer. I put in here as an example or an illustration, the music ministry, the, I say the music ministry, the music industry, much of what the message in music is today. Now, I don't listen to secular music unless it's on the radio at the gym and I don't even really pay, I don't pay attention to it too much. Um, <clears throat> and it depends on what station that you're listening to. But I do know that there's different genres of music, and I ain't picking on nobody's particular music. But I do know this. I'm talking about the world's music in general. I do know that there's a big emphasis in the world's music today that screams a message. And the message, essentially, it might sound different from one song to the other. The lyrics might be different from one song to the other. The beat might be different from one song to the other. But the overall emphasis of the message is this. Basically, ain't nobody going to give you nothing. You got to get what you got coming to you now. And if you got to take it by force, then you do it. Okay? And that's essentially the message of what, in other words, go get what you got coming to you right now. And what I'm here to tell you is, is that that is completely contrary to the message of the Bible. That doesn't sit right with some people. Some people are like, well, guess what? Then I don't want the God you serve in the Bible that you read from. Well, that may be the choice that you make, but I'm here to tell you this morning, that's what the message of the cross speaks of. It's a message of self-denial. It's a message where self dies so that he can now begin to live through us. It's not a message where we get everything that we want right here, right now. That's another thing I'll say real quick. The modern church is telling a lie many times. When you flip on the channels of the TV, and you see the preacher. Look, I didn't see one preacher. The people done threw money all up on the altar. 
Everybody just walking up. And, and listen, if that's what they do, that's on them. I'm not, but they, but they over there throwing money all up on the altar. And the one guy just comes dancing through there, boy. He's dancing and money's flying all over the place. And this is the focal point of their gospel. Everybody's focused on money. And the gospel's going to get you a financial blessing. But wait, hold on a second. Not everybody gets financially blessed from the gospel. Oh, a lot of them preachers that are on, on the television that are telling them, go ahead. Go ahead and make a call right now and plant your thousand dollar seed. Oh, he's getting a financial blessing. His pockets are getting full. His bank account's getting full. But the people that are pouring out of their own pockets aren't necessarily getting a blessing. Because you know why? I'm here to can you out give God? Absolutely not. But what I'm here to tell you is that's not how God operates. This isn't some kind of casino Christianity where you going to put in some money and you're going to hit a jackpot? That's not the way that this works. No. The gospel says you're going to live for Jesus whether he puts money in your pocket or not. The apostle Paul sitting in a prison in the, in the Roman Empire and he's saying, I am fulfilled with the things that God is doing in me and I'm here to tell you the kingdom of God is real and I want you to become a partaker of it. So we got the world over here speaking a message to us through the music that it's making. We got the modern church over here speaking a message to us that and both of them are lies and both of them are telling us that we need to go in a particular direction and the word of God is saying none of that is true I am truth and if you want to know the right way you're going to have to follow after me amen instead of looking to eternity and what God prepared they will attempt to take what the world is offering today the first point number one I want to talk to you about this morning is inheritance of light and deliverance from darkness. If you'll go to Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. He says, uh, he says, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. That's the inheritance right there. The inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son Amen. in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins so point number one inheritance of light and deliverance from darkness in this first passage he wants the Christians to know that God has made them meet the word there literally means qualified God qualified you to become a partaker of the inheritance of the children of light what does that mean you weren't qualified before. When you were born in Adam in sin, you were born in sin and therefore you were not qualified to be an inheritor of the kingdom of light. Amen? What it, whenever it talks about heirs, you know, I might have too much information here, but we're going to go ahead and try. Can you go to Psalm chapter 2, verses 1 through 3? I just want to try to explain something real quick. I want to, what I'm trying to explain to you when we go through these passages of Scripture is that God's plan is that His Son Jesus, even in the Old Testament before Jesus was born, His plan was to give Jesus an inheritance. Just like a father gives an inheritance to his son, God the Father has an inheritance for His Son Jesus. Amen? In the wedding banquet that we read about in Matthew 22, it talks about the king who has a, uh, a plan for his son. Amen? The king has a plan for his son to, to give an inheritance, and he's looking for a bride that's willing to marry the son. Amen? And so he sends people out, in the, and, and really what he's talking about in the first part of that parable is that he sends people to the nation of Israel. And he, and, and, and he says, hey, this is the son. This is the manifestation. We promised he was coming. Now he's here. But they rejected it. And so then he says, go out into the highways and the byways and anybody that's willing to marry the son, let him come in to the bank. Amen. And so what I'm telling you is that on a grand scale, that's what God's doing. God is looking for people that are willing to enter into relationship with his son, amen, to marry the son in order to become inheritors of that kingdom. But the, overall, the whole kingdom is for the son. Right? And I wanted to show you this. In, in, in Psalm chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, it says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Verse 2. 
The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Next verse. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. What does that mean? Well, this is a psalm that's written by King David, eight, uh, B.C. 900, about. And what it's talking about is, is talking about the Lord and his anointed. That word anointed right there, if you were going to read it, if it was translated in English, this is how it would be spelled. Messiah. That's where we get the word Messiah. The anointed. What that's talking about is Jesus. And, well, this is going to be translated the way that it sounds in the Hebrew language, okay? It's like Messiah. That's not how you spell it in English. That's how it's spelled in the Hebrew dictionary. All right? So, Messiah, the anointed one. So what this passage of Scripture is talking about is talking about Jesus. It said that the kings of the earth have uh, set themselves. Go back to the verse, verse 1. It talks about the fact that the kings of the earth, why do the heathen rage? What does heathen mean? Those people that don't know God. Why are they raging? Why are they coming against the plan of God? Why do the people, the, the people of the world, why do they imagine a vain thing, an empty thing? What do they do? Next verse, it says that they, the kings of the earth, leaders of the world, what do they do? They set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed one. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that even the Bible tells us that in this world today, there are world rulers, world governments that are under the influence of the enemy that are against the ways of God and against the plan of God, against God and against his anointed is the point that I'm trying to make. But if you go to verse 8 in here, God, God laughs at them. He views what they're doing and he understands what they're trying to do. But when it says it all said and done, he says, ask of me, he's talking about the anointed one. Ask of me and I shall give the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Ultimately, Jesus is going to inherit this earth is what I'm trying to tell you. And what the Apostle Paul is talking about, the fact is that we are going to be co-heirs with him. We are going to be inheritors of light. Amen. This great plan that God has put forth allows the human creation who had fallen into sin through Adam to be forgiven and receive an eternal inheritance. You know, he talked about the fact also in this passage of scripture that we were translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Amen. So part of the inheritance is the fact that there was a translation that took place. I like to use this as an illustration a lot of times about the fact that sometimes whenever before we were in a previous kingdom, we were out here. We were out here in the kingdom of darkness. We were born of Adam, but then when somebody told us the gospel and we believed by faith, we were translated. We were translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, into the kingdom of light. Now we're no longer living out there in the kingdom of darkness. See, when people think of the kingdom of light or the kingdom of God, they oftentimes want to look up in the sky and they say, oh, there's the kingdom of God up there in heaven. No, you need to understand something. There's two kingdoms that coexist on the earth today. There's a kingdom of light and there's a kingdom of darkness. Amen. Amen. One day, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God is going to be manifest physically on the earth. But until then, it's living on the inside of his people. Amen. The kingdom of light is living on the inside of his people. And so the gospel news that reaches into our hearts and saves us, translates us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And it allows us to be able to be inheritors of light. Now, in that passage of scripture we were looking at in Colossians 1, 12 through 14, it says, after it says we were delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son, it says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. That's how this whole thing took place. We were redeemed. The releasing that is effected or caused through the payment of a ransom. A ransom had to be paid. We were originally born into sin and slavery, but we need to understand that a ransom was paid, and the ransom that was paid was the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen. The price for our release and translation from one kingdom to another 
being made worthy to inherit the kingdom of God. And what it offers was the life of Jesus as he offered his death for our sin. That was point number one. That yes, we're an inheritor of light, but that we've also been translated from darkness into light. Amen. But point number two that I want to talk to you about is endurance until the end. Colossians chapter 1, verses 22 through 23. Endurance until the end. In the body of his flesh, through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. You see that part? Go back to that part where it says, if ye continue in the faith. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. When it comes to the gospel, it doesn't, it's not as important how you start it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, some people walk up in the church, man, they get saved, they fall out, they get slain in the Holy Ghost, they fall out. So, you know, they, they jump up and down, they get all excited, but guess what? The, the parable of the sower talks about the fact that some of the seed was sown where the soil had rocks in it, and it prevented the root from going down. And so when the sun came up, which was like a trial or a tribulation, because it had no root, it, guess what happened? It withered away. It began to wither away. So what I'm here to tell you is it's more about the end of the race than it is about the beginning of the race. One of the things that you and I need to understand is that there's a battle that's raging. Now that you've been translated from one kingdom to the other, don't think that the enemy of your soul doesn't know that you changed teams. And one thing that you need to understand is this. He is relentless. He will not quit. He will attempt in any way with all of his intelligence, all of his power, all of his, uh, if you want to call it, evil wisdom in order to cause you to, to defect or to quit in the faith. Right. He doesn't expect you to do it all, all, all at once. Instead, he's more than happy to slowly and insidiously plant seeds of doubt, cause little sin. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. What is leaven? It's yeast. It's like sin. When you put yeast in a batch of dough, what does it do? It takes over. When you put a little bit of sin in the midst of your life, what does it do? It begins to take over. And the next thing you know, you're, you're, you're falling away from the things of God. You're no longer hungry for the things of God. That's right. And the Apostle Paul says, if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. The enemy wants to move you away from the hope of the gospel. With all of his might and all of his intelligence, like I said, he will try to move you away. Go to Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. A lot of times, uh, people don't realize, but there, there's, a, there's a, you know, the majority is not serving God. Do, do you, you realize that, right? Okay. The majority is not serving God. The word of God says that. It says in Matthew 17, 13 through 14, Enter ye in at the straight gate. That means narrow. For wide is the gate, broad is the way, that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. Just because the majority of the crowd is going in a certain direction, doesn't mean that it's the right direction to travel. I can remember, I, uh, you know, I put in my notes here, be a thinker, and I put down there Mardi Gras. Now, for most of you, I don't have to convince you about Mardi Gras, but, you know, a lot of people still think Mardi Gras is okay. If you go to Mardi Gras at the parade, if I happen to be driving before the parade starts and I see you on the side of the road, look, I ain't even going to think twice about it. <laughs> but if you ever ask me, I'm going to tell you what I think. You're not going to convince me that that's of the Lord? How are you going to convince me that's of the Lord? It's not of God. 
That is not of God. That is not of the kingdom of God. You have floats with false gods on them and everybody doing this number here. You have people that are getting drunk that are raising their children to think that this whole parade and revelry, the roots of it, come from false gods, the worship of false gods, getting drunk and having illicit sex. There's no way you're ever going to convince me that the roots of that or the fruit of that is anything of the Lord. But if the majority of the crowd says it's okay, and you got this one little group over here that calls it into question, then what do you think people are going to think? Oh, then people are crazy. Then people are foolish. How could they be right and everybody else be wrong? I'm here to tell you right now that a lot of times people's minds are skewed. The way that they see that particular situation isn't right. I mean, after all, the church says it's okay. Mm -hmm. See, the Catholic Church, this starts way back in the day. The Catholic Church couldn't prevent people from partaking in pagan revelry. So what they did was they swallowed the whole thing up and they said, look, on Tuesday, you go live your life fat. On Wednesday, we slap some ashes on your head. We're going to make it all good. And now you're endorsed and it's okay. So we're going to... Even as a young kid, when I was at Mardi Gras, which I never really liked the parades, but I sure did like to get wasted, and I sure did like to look for girls. Even when I was doing all that, you think for one second I would have connected that to church? <laughs> no. How are you going to connect that to church? Now, how does this have anything to do with the things of God? No, we out here feeding our flesh is what right. we're doing. Right. This is not of God. And I can remember one time when my girls were young, Daddy, so-and-so and so-and-so, and they all go to the parade. And I'm like, well, baby, we don't go to parades. But you know what? I started thinking to myself, if I'm going to raise my children to be able to see the difference, then guess what? I'm going to have to, under a controlled situation, allow them to experience for themselves. All right, I'm going to let you go. But what I need you to look for is all the stuff that's going on around you, and I need you to come back and give me a report. Well, the report was, it didn't seem that bad. Guess what? You ain't older. You can't think for yourself. You're not old enough to think for yourself. You can't think for yourself, and you ain't going back again. If that's the conclusion that you came to, you came to the wrong conclusion. Because everybody else is out there doing it, and you see church folk out there doing it, now you think it's okay. No, I'm here to tell you that it's not okay because it's against the very word of God. God says it's wrong. Does he say Mardi Gras is wrong? Yeah, actually he does. And I'm not going to get into it right now, but he talks about it. And I think it's in the book of Ephesians. With the word revelry by itself literally means a, a parade to Bacchus. Oh, yeah. That's what the whole thing's about. Mm -hmm. This stuff's been going on. They just keep, he just, the enemy keeps refabricating it. And people continue, we're raising our children in the ways of the world. If my, if my children decide to go the way of the world, that's going to be on them. But it won't be because I raised them that way. Right? It'll be because I did my best by the grace of God to try to train them up in the ways of God. And to try to show them the difference between the world and light, between darkness and light. And then at some point in time, people got to make a choice on whether they're going to be an inheritor of light or an inheritor of darkness. And they're going to have to make a choice whether or not they will be settled and grounded until the end, whether they will remain steadfast in the faith, or whether or not they will allow things into their lives that will slowly turn them away from the things of God. The enemy will not quit. It's he who endures to the end. See, just because the crowd's going in a certain direction, what the Lord would say to us, what the Apostle Paul would say what God would say through the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. This is what the Apostle Paul would tell you and I. He said, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates? In other words, you need to examine your life. You need to, I need to. We need to examine our life. We need to examine the way that we're living. And if Jesus is living in us, then there should be certain fruit manifested out of us. Amen. We don't need necessarily everybody else to judge us. We need the Lord, the word, amen, the Holy Spirit. It's going to be relevant. It's going to be evident whether or not we're truly living our lives as the children of light. So the enemy will try with sin and false teaching and the wisdom of the world to make us believe that the things that are against God are really okay. And he will slowly begin to chip away at what is truth and try to cause us to believe a lie. And one day he hopes that we will find ourselves on the broad instead of the narrow. And that we will be moved away from the hope of the gospel that we heard. And that we will not endure until the end. And that we will not inherit 
what was promised. This, as I was looking at this, this message, this verse that Gaudi said while we were in Mexico popped in my head. Matthew 10, 22. Matthew 10, 22. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endures till the end shall be saved. It's not just about what you're getting today. Everybody's focused on their blessing they're going to get today. The Word of God says, if you truly live for the Lord, at some point in time, you're going to face some persecution. There's going to be some separation away from the world. But guess what? He that endures until the end, amen, he's going to be saved. If you remain steadfast in the faith, if you don't turn your back on the faith, the enemy is going to try with everything that's in him to cause you to turn away from the things of God. Point number three. So point number one is that you're an inheritor of light. You've been translated from light into darkness. Amen. Uh, point number two is you got to endure till the end. Amen. Point number three is that you got to be on guard at all times. Colossians chapter two, verses six through ten. It says, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk you in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. He said, beware, unless any man spoil you. He said, the same way you came into faith in Christ is the same way that each and every day you continue to walk your faith out in Christ. Well, how did I come into faith in Christ? I heard the gospel. I heard that I was a sinner. I heard that Jesus died on the cross for my sin and that I needed to be born again or give my life to him. When I put faith in Jesus, God allowed my sin to be paid for on Jesus at the cross. And in exchange, he gave me Jesus's righteousness. Faith in that allowed grace to change me. Each and every day now, as I'm going to continue to live for God, my faith must remain in what Jesus did for me at the cross, which gives me a right standing with God, which allows grace to flow in my life. I know that's a lot of words, but it's actually pretty simple. What does it mean? It means I'm dependent on God and what he sent, which was Jesus. It means I'm not righteous in and of myself. It means that no matter how many times I go to church, how much I read my Bible, how much I pray, all those things that I'm doing don't make me right in the eyes of God. What makes me right in the eyes of God is that God has one plan, one man. His name was Jesus. Amen. And he offered him on the cross as a payment for the penalty of my sin. What does it mean? It means that as I keep my faith, faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for me at the cross, God gives me grace. I don't even have to understand it as much as the preacher seems to understand it. What I just got to do is I got to believe it. I got to believe that I'm hopeless and I'm helpless all by myself and left to myself I'll never make it. I got to believe that I can't be independent but that I got to be Dependent. I got to believe that just like a little child, I have to come to him and I have to trust in him and I have to say, Jesus, you're the only one that can make me right. Amen. Jesus, you had to die on a cross to pay for my sin. My sin's a problem. Amen. It separates me from the father, but the father is a God of love and he has a prescription and he sent his son. And if each and every day I'll keep my faith in that, I have right standing with God. Yeah. And as I have right standing with God, let me tell you, there's blessings for the children of God. Yeah. It's not always a Mercedes. It's not always a three-piece suit. Amen. It's not always a Rolex watch. Sometimes a spiritual blessing. Amen. To be honest with you, that's what I need. Yeah. I need spiritual blessings. I need spiritual wisdom. I need God's hand to be on my life. Yeah. Amen. I need God to change me. Because one of the biggest problems that I have is when I try to hold on to self in the midst of this world, right? My self gets in the way. I don't know about you, but my self gets in the way of what God's trying to do in my life. You know what I'm learning that the older I get? Guess what? I still got situations I got to humble myself. Stuff happens to me all the time I don't like. And I'm learning that it's so much easier if I can just humble myself. Instead of trying to flare up like some bandy rooster and pick a fight. You know? Lord, just help me. 
Amen? Change yes, me. Yes, amen. I have to learn to become dependent <coughs> on Him. So that's the first part of it. You got to learn how to walk <coughs> with the Lord through faith each and every day. Your faith, I'm going to keep saying this kind of stuff till you really get a revelation of it. Your faith has to have an object. The object of your faith is Jesus Christ and what he did for you at the cross. Amen. Why? Because it translated you from darkness into light. Yes. Because it keeps you in the light. Because it keeps you covered in his righteousness. Because it keeps you in right relationship Amen. with the Father. Amen. Because it keeps you in receiving access to grace. Because it's what keeps you in victory. Yes. Amen? Beware! That's what he said next. See, that's what number three is, on guard at all times. Beware. The word literally, it comes from two words, be aware. <laughs> be aware. In other words, it has the idea of, being, of looking, being observant and aware. Be aware of what? That no man spoil you. The idea of spoil there literally means to be carried off in booty. <laughs> the word booty there. I know it's an outdated word. It doesn't mean somebody's derriere. It means like a pirate's booty, a treasure. Like something that, the spoil that you take from the war, right? Whenever somebody goes in and conquers a nation, they take spoil. And that's the idea. That be, care, be aware that you don't be carried off as spoil. That you would be uh, confused. That you would be spoiled through philosophy and vain deceit. After the traditions of men. What does that mean? It means that if you're not careful, you're going to be taken captive as a prisoner or a slave. And the way that it happened was that some false teacher, some philosopher, some person that had human wisdom came in and he began to put little words of doubt on the inside of you. And you began to believe his words instead of the word of God. And the next thing you know, you were taken captive and enslaved and your relationship with the Lord was spoiled. You were carried captive. He says, be aware of that. Beware. Keep your eyes focused. Don't believe every preacher that you hear. Don't believe every, every group that you're a part of. Listen to me. If you start looking close enough, you'll see that some of the people you're hanging around with and some of the people you're talking to, if you stay in the faith and you allow the word of God to have its way in your heart, you're going to start to realize you're starting to think a whole lot different than the people that are around you. Yes. And even if you're not talking different yet, and you're not always thinking different yet, when they say something that, and the Holy Ghost says, Hur! you're like, boy, I know that that ain't right. Even though I ain't going to say nothing right now, even though I might even laughing at that stupid joke, I, I know that ain't right. Right there. Oh, something in me is saying that that is not right. right, right. Y'all know what I'm yeah. talking about. Yeah. And as you let that thing grow in you, it's going to reveal to you that you are different. You're a children of light. You're a child of light. You're not a child of darkness. Amen? Now, you know what? I got good news. I've known some people that can hang out with some people in the world. I mean, I believe Sean's one of them. I've seen other people that they still got some friends that are in the world. I don't know that they spend all their time with them, but they still got some friends that are in the world, spend some time with them, and still are able to plant some seeds about Jesus. Amen? They don't engage in the behavior that those people are doing. And with time, guess what? I've seen one of our old friends that we went to nursing school with. He gave his heart to Jesus. I'm not telling you that you got to completely isolate yourself. I'm telling you, you got to use wisdom. Amen. And that you don't live like they live. You don't do what they do. If they still want you around, even though you're not doing everything that they do, well, then that's fine. But if you're compromising, it don't work that way. Amen. All right. Amen. So don't get spoiled. Don't get carried off in the booty. Amen. Uh, Paul warns and encourages. He warns that there will be men with vain philosophies. The overall idea is that men with empty philosophies who appear to be full of wisdom without even realizing it, at least sometimes the wisdom they received, it didn't even come from the Spirit of God. It came from demon spirits. Yeah. We talked about that before we really got started. All false doctrine is coming from demonic spirits. Yeah. Whether they stand behind a pulpit in the church doesn't matter. That's where he likes to hang out the most to cause confusion for the people of God. If you go to Ephesians chapter 4, Verse 14, it says that we henceforth, so in other words, from this day forward, be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie 
in wait to deceive. Well, there's a lot of a lot of words there, right? It's kind of like, what does it mean? Well, you see that word slight right there? I've talked about to you about this before. I like this passage of scripture. It's like that little card game, you know, that they do on the street where they fold the cards up a little bit. What's it called? Shell. The shell game, the little pea under the shell, or the card game where they 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 like, okay, and they and they're like, okay, which where, where's the ace of spades? And you're supposed to try to guess what it's the sleight of hand. It's like the hand's quick, so it's a purposeful deception move. And what he's saying is, is that there's false teachers with false doctrine that are purposefully bringing heresy into the church that ultimately cause the people like a ship on an ocean without a functioning rudder being tossed to and fro, the ship, the ways of life. The Apostle Paul said that we're not supposed to be that. We're not supposed to be taken captive by vain philosophies. We're not to be brought made spoiled through, through empty philosophies, but that instead through good doctrine that teaches us the ways of God and how to have a relationship with Jesus. We're supposed to be stable, rooted, and grounded in the faith. Amen? And that we are to be strengthened by the ways of God. All right, point number four, removing the old. Colossians 2, chapter 11 through 13. I'm sorry, verses 11 through 13. Removing the old. The old man that we were. In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. And putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him, that talks about death, buried with him in baptism. Wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead, and you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, has he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses. He says there's a circumcision that's done without hands. In the Old Testament, we've talked about this, but you got to understand it. you you got to understand the word that you're reading, or else it just doesn't make any sense, right? In the Old Testament, the circumcision was the outward sign that the people of God were in relationship with God. It was the sign of their covenant with Him. What it literally was, it was a cutting away of that old piece of flesh through the shedding of blood and, and throwing, throwing it away. I mean, the removal of the old. All right? So that's all spiritual. I had somebody ask me in the church one time, hey man, what's up with that circumcision stuff? I'm like, dude, don't stress. You don't have to be, you don't have to be physically circumcised. That's not what we're talking about. Okay? Um, that, that's not what's going on here. That was Old Testament. All right, For them to be in right relationship with God, that, that's how they were separated. What Paul's talking about here is that there's a circumcision made without hands. Meaning, when you get saved, that the Holy Spirit does a circumcision of your heart. Just as that old piece of flesh was removed away, now in Christ, the old man dies and he's done away with. He's, he's removed and he's done away with. Removing the old. That's who we used to be. Before we came to Christ, that's who we used to be. The person that hung out with all them people and listened to the message that they listened to as far as the music and did all the things that they did when we were children of darkness, before we were translated into the kingdom of light, before we were inheritors of light, we were like them. Now, in Christ, we've received a circumcision that's done without hands. The hand of God, if you will. He's done a work on us. Amen? Now I want to close with this. Number five, thinking like new. Colossians 3, 1 through 2. It says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. So when it's all said and done, and we realize we're inheritors of light. We've been translated from darkness into light. We've realized that we're not supposed to allow people through vain philosophy to spoil us, to take us away, that we're to be aware that this is something to be protected. We realize that there's a removal of the old, a circumcision of the heart, a change on the inside, that ultimately the change produces a new man, amen, with new desires. And what he's saying is, is that if you really are a Christian and you're really seated in the mind of God, you're in Jesus and Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. This is, 
this is just kind of like going through the motions. Not really going through the motions to help me to find the right words that I'm trying to say. The point that I'm trying to make is this. Jesus already won. He defeated the enemy at the cross. Right? One day he's coming back to rule and reign. Yes. In the meantime, God has allowed us to be in this time frame known as the church age to go through the motions. Not just going through the motions, but to live it out. To live out the Christian life. Amen? And that the Christian, because he's now new creation in Christ, and the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of him, guess what should happen? There should be new desires, right? That, that just makes sense, does it not? Shouldn't there be new desires on the inside of our heart? Desires for the things of God instead of the things of the world? Amen? Now, granted, sometimes that takes time. It doesn't all happen overnight. Amen? But we need the Lord to do work on the inside of our hearts. Amen? And to bring us to that place.